All right, everybody, I apologize about that. Laptop completely crashed, and it seemed to indicate it was related to the webcam. So I am turning that off for now so that there is less chance of it happening again. All right, looks like we're back. Any questions so far about uh, functions or structs that we have gone over so far? Okay, feel free to keep typing a question if you've got one going. Uh, next up is pointers. So you can go ahead and make a new folder called pointers. And we'll do a new file inside called pointers. We'll do a package main and a func main. So pointers are something that are always there behind the scenes when you're programming in, in any language, uh, but a lot of languages hide them from you. Uh, Java, for instance, doesn't really give you any visibility into them. Um, they're there, you're working with them all the time, but you just don't know it. Um, some languages like C let you do anything you want with pointers. You can see them and modify them and do anything you want, which is nice, but also dangerous. Um, and there are languages that fall somewhere in the middle, like C Sharp gives you access to pointers only in unsafe blocks. Um, and you have some, you can kind of simulate them by using structs and classes. Um, Go is kind of nice and it gives you visibility into pointers. It doesn't let you do anything you, you want with them like C does, uh, but it does uh, let you use them and, and see them uh, with a, very, a syntax very similar to C, which is nice. Because if you get familiar uh, with them in Go, uh, if you needed to become, you know, switch, if you, decide, if you decide to switch to C or C later, um, you'll be pretty comfortable doing so. You'll have more of an idea of what's going on right away. Uh, so the basic idea is this. So, so far we've just been using um, what you might call values, right? So we've done things like x equals five, for instance. So we have a variable x and its value is uh, five, right? And we can print, print our value. So we've done stuff like that before, and that's no problem. Um, and the way we get a pointer to a thing is we use the ampersand symbol. And what the ampersand symbol says is give me the address of this value. And by address, what that means is the actual address uh, <coughs> in the memory of your computer. Not, not quite the physical memory, because the operating system, when you run a program, gives your program some virtual memory. But it is the address in that virtual memory, uh, memory that this number is living. So you can actually imagine <coughs> your computer has got addresses numbered one through whatever. They don't necessarily start at one. And your variables end up living in them, right? So this might be where x is, so the value inside memory address one would be equal to five. Memory address two might have something else. So when you <coughs> use the ampersand symbol, you get back the address that x lives in in memory. And you can actually print that out and see it. All right, so you see this crazy uh, hexadecimal number here is the address in our virtual memory that the value for x lives in. Um, so if you have a pointer to x like we have here, and if you look at the, the type of this, if you hover over in VS Code, oh, it's not going to tell us. But this is a type that would look like this if you were to uh, specify it. Sorry. Right, so that's equivalent to what we had before. Uh, so 
<clears throat> to indicate you want a pointer to a thing, you prepend a star to it and then give the type you want. So this means it's a pointer, star means pointer, to an int. And you can get the pointer to an int by getting the address of an int variable. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so that's kind of neat that we can like see the memory address that our variable is living in. Uh, but what good is it? Uh, we can't modify these pointer values. Uh, so what, what can we do with them? So here's an example of what, <clears throat> kind of what it means and why it's important. So we had to add one function before that took in a value and returned a new value. Let's say we didn't want to do that. So this has no return value. So we're going to take uh, our x, which is equal to 5, and pass it to add 1. OK. So what do you expect uh, the value will be printed out here? We are passing in 5 to add 1, add 1 to x. What should we get? OK. It's still five, and if you're totally new to programming, that might seem weird, because we added one to x. Uh, but we have to remember is this x here only happens to have the same name as the x down here, because I typed it the same. This could be anything. It could be a number. And when you pass something to a function, it is passing a copy. It's not sending our x value to the add one function. It is making a copy of the number five and using that in the add one function. So what we did was we added one to the copy and then did nothing with it. And so when the function returns, that copy actually just disappears. It is popped off the, the stack. And when we're printing this, we're just printing the original, the original x, which is unchanged. So it's still five. Does that make sense so far? <laughs> Someone is commenting on the mic quality, and I apologize. I'm traveling this week, so I'm just on my laptop. So I hope I'm at least understandable. It will be better again starting uh, next uh, Sunday. Or next Thursday, actually. All right, so what if we did want for add one to actually change the x that we pass it? Well, we can do that with a pointer. So. Let's change this function to take in a pointer to an int. And let's pass it the pointer to our int. And then we'll print x. OK. Now we see we have an error here. Because you cannot add 1 to a pointer to an int. So we have to do something. And what you can do is dereference the pointer. And you can do that with the star symbol. So when you use the star symbol on your variable, what that's saying is, give me the thing that the pointer points to. So we're going to get the thing that the pointer points to and add one to that. And we're going to set the thing the pointer points to to num plus one. So if we run it now, now we get six. So we passed a pointer to this actual x value here to the function. And the function dereferences the pointer, adds 1 to 5, sets it equal to x. This is effectively pointing to this x here. So then when the function uh, finishes, this actual value has been modified. And we can print, print it. And we see the, the 6 increment. OK, so that's one sense in which pointers can be useful. Um, if, you, if you want the function to actually be able to change the thing you're passing to it, rather than getting a copy of it and changing the copy. 
Uh, another reason it can be useful, if you, <clears throat> let's actually go take our structs from before. We'll just copy these in here and paste. <clears throat> and before, let's take that function too. So we had the where is bad guy function. So when we pass an actual bad guy, uh, it is having to make a copy of the entire struct. So it's having to make a copy of the name, make a copy of the health, make a copy of the position, which means make a copy of the X and make a copy of the Y. So that's a lot of data to copy and pass to the function. Now it's fine when you're doing it with something like an integer because the size of an integer is about the same size as a, uh, it usually is the same size as a pointer to an integer or nearly so, depending on your, your platform. It'll be like 32 or 64 bits, whether it's an int or a pointer to an int. However, this bad guy is much more than 32 bits. We've got 64 bits of floats here. We got the, uh, the string, which is a, a few more bits, another uh, 32 or 64 bits for your health and, and so on. So we'd rather not, <coughs> uh, if we have large structs, not have to make a bunch of, of copying to pass it to a function. So instead, we can take in a pointer to a bad guy. And so then we could say, um, here, we'll do some more copying from here. Grab this bad guy. And now we can say, where is bad guy, bad guy. This is actually going to be an error. Let me see that pop up here. Because this function is not expecting a bad guy anymore. It's expecting a pointer to a bad guy. And remember, we can get that with the ampersand symbol. And now everything's good. And then one thing you might be wondering is up here, when we wanted to work with the actual number, so we could add one to it, we had to dereference it first. And here, we're not doing any dereferencing to access the members of the struct. And that is just something Go does for you. When, when you work with a pointer to a struct, Go will automatically dereference it for you when you use it this way. And it's, it's just safe to do that. There's nothing else you could possibly mean. If you're used to uh, C or C++, in this scenario, you would need to change the dot to an arrow to be able to access uh, the members inside a pointer to a struct. But in Go, it just converts that for you, uh, which is nice because then if you uh, decide to use a pointer uh, instead of a value or a value instead of a pointer, you don't have to refactor your code and switch periods to arrows or arrows to periods. You can just leave it exactly the same. So that's kind of nice. So let's give this a try. And there we go. Now we can print out Two, and we've done that in this case by only passing the pointer, which is 32 or 64 bits, depending on your platform, instead of having to pass, uh, make copies of all of this stuff and send it to the function. Make sense so far? All right, and another thing you have to consider when you use pointers this way is now a function can change the thing you're passing it. And sometimes that's not desirable. So you have to kind of think about it's each situation, whether it makes more sense to pass things as, as pointers or not. Um, if you're used to languages like, uh, like Java, when you're working with objects in Java, you're always passing uh, them indirectly. You're never making copies. You're always passing uh, a pointer to an object effectively. It's just, it's just hidden from you. All right. So I think if everyone's feeling pretty good about this, we could start on our first very simple uh, text adventure. We have, we have the tools we need to do it. So why don't we get started? And if, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into chat. I'll, I will check again in a minute. So I'm gonna call, start a new folder. I'm gonna call it linear story. Oh. I put that inside structs. I'm just going to drag it back out. I'm 
linear story dot go package main main. All right. So let's say we wanted to make a linear text adventure. And that's also known as a book, basically. Um, it's the simplest kind of text adventure we could have. Uh, but we're going to be able to expand very easily from that to some to things that are far more interesting. So if we did want to make a book or a linear text adventure, uh, one way we could do it, just have like a print line statement for, uh, for each page, right? And, uh, you know, there's a dark and stormy night. You are alone. And you need to find sacred helmet before the bad guys do, right? And you can just keep on going. Uh, but there's some limitations here. Um, so also we might want to, uh, let's see, where did we do? Yeah, so we're gonna wanna do some inputs. So what we want to do is have a linear story where someone presses uh, enter to go from one page to the next. So we can use our scanner that we used from guess the number. To make it pause at each at each page. Let's let's give this a story so far. So let's give this a try, see how it works so far. All right, it was a dark and stormy night. Hit enter. You're alone, you need to find the sacred helmet before the bad guys do. And we see a troll ahead. Okay, so this is fine, and you could basically write a book this way, but you're doing a lot of repeating of yourself, right? The don't repeat you principles being uh, broken here. You're having to type scanner.scan after every single page and format.printline, uh, you know, you'd be doing that 100 times if it's a big story. Um, there's lots of other problems here. Like maybe you would want to uh, load the story from a file so people could create their own linear stories uh, that, that you could then play through. Um, there's no way to do that if you're doing it this way because someone would have to edit the source code to make their own story. Um, if you wanted players to be able to add their own pages to the story, like they could get to some point and then insert a new page or delete a page, uh, we have no way to provide uh, that facility, right? Again, you'd have to like stop the game, edit the source code, and then and then play through it again. So what we want here is a data structure that gives us the ability to do those things. Um, things like load it from a file or let people insert or remove new pages to the book and to let us uh, iterate over the data structure to print the pages out uh, rather than having to have hundreds of lines of print lines and scans to wait between pages. So let's make our own type. And we'll call it a uh, story page. And it's going to be a struct, which is what we just learned about. So one thing that every story page is going to have for sure is it's going to have some text that we're going to print out. So we'll, we'll make a, a member called text, and that'll be a string. <clears throat> and then the next thing every page is going to have is the next page. Right? So you're reading a book, you go from one page to the next. So each page will have a next page, and that will be a story page. And we learned before that it's fine for a struct to have a struct inside of it. So this should be OK, except it isn't. And if we hover over this, you'll see the error, invalid recursive type story page. So already we're seeing the word recursive come up, which I talked about briefly when I showed how functions could call themselves. So the problem here is that if a story page contains a next page, which is a story page, then that next page also contains a next page. And so if the compiler were really going to literally build this data structure the way we've defined it, you would have text 
next page, and then <clears throat> that next page would have text and a next page, right? And if it just kept going, obeying your, your design, it would make this infinitely large, right? It would consume all the memory of your laptop and, and crash, just like my laptop crashed earlier. So we can't do that. But we want to do something like this. So what do we do? Well, this is where uh, pointers can become useful again. So we don't actually want to store an entire next page. We just want a pointer to the next page. So we just put a star in front to indicate that we want a pointer to a story page type, uh, not an actual story page type. And now the compiler is happy. So now that we have a <coughs> pointer set up, we can start uh, building our story uh, in an entirely different way that can make it more flexible. So if we want to make pages now, let me actually bring that back. So let's say page one is equal to a story page. We will reuse our awesome story. Yeah, let's do it like this. I know, this is fun. Okay, so it's easy enough to initialize our new struct with the text that we want, but what do we provide for the next page when we haven't got it ready yet? Um, so one thing we can do for now is we can pass something called nil. And nil is vaguely equivalent to null in other languages. If you've done uh, some C or Java or C sharp, um, Let's see, why is this unhappy? Oh, that's fine. Um, basically what it's saying is, <clears throat> uh, in this case, the pointer currently is a, it's a nil pointer. So we're like, we don't have a, a, a pointer yet. But that's okay. Um, then we're gonna do page two. Copy this. And this will be nil for now. I'm a little bit slow on my laptop, laptop keyboard too, I apologize. Okay. So now we've got three pages set up just so we can try things out. Now we can set next page, page one, it's page two, page two dot next page, page three. Oh, the address of page two and the address of page three, because next page is a pointer, so we gotta get the address of these values. And then page three, we're actually gonna leave the uh, pointer to the next page nil. And what that'll do is give us a way to know when we've reached the end of the book, right? Uh, soon we're gonna start going through this, uh, this data structure piece by piece. And we'll know we've reached the end if the next page is equal to nil. We'll know that there's no more, okay? Any questions so far? All right, we've got 10 minutes left. I think that's just enough to do uh, the most basic thing here we wanna do, which is kind of to, to play through the story. Um, so let's call that, let's make a function. We'll call it <coughs> play the story. And it's gonna take 
a uh, story page, pointer to a story page, so page, story page. And first thing it's going to do is print the text. Page.text. And then we're going to use recursion, which we talked about earlier, on the next page. All right, so Play Story takes in a page, prints its text, and then prints the next page. Uh, we got a problem here because this would try to run forever. So we need to check for the base case. Whenever you're doing recursion, you, you should think about what is the base case. The base case here is if uh, page.next page. Let's just, let's just do it like this. There's a couple ways to do this, but this is simpler. So if story page equals nil, and remember that for comparison, we use two equals. then we just want to return from the function. So th this is a function that has no return type. Uh, you can still return with nothing. Why is this unhappy? Um, oh, sorry. If page equals nil, we're going to just quit. Otherwise, we're going to print the text of the page and go to the next page. So let's play story, starting from page one. And we'll give it a go. What is this stuff about? Oh. Okay, I'm trying to pass the value page one, but we need a pointer. So I need to use the ampersand to get the address of page one. All right, and here we go. Now we're seeing our story printed out in order. It was a dark and stormy night. You're alone, you see a troll head, and then it quit. Um, so some key ideas here. Um, for one, if we didn't have this check for null, what do we think will happen? So let's try it. All right, we got a runtime error. So this compiled fine, but when it tried to run, it eventually got to a point where play story was called with a nil pointer. And so when you get here and try to print the text field of the nil pointer, that doesn't exist. And so it errors. So null pointers are something you always need to be careful for in languages that have null pointers, and, and Go does. It's a very common error that you forget to check for the possibility of a pointer being null. So that's why that check has to be there. So if, if this pointer is null, then we just, we're done. We know that's the last page of the book. So that's why that's there. All right, so now we're back to working. All right, now what we've done here is we've made a very basic, probably the most basic data structure. It's common and important data structure in computer science called a linked list. And a linked list is just what we've done here. It's, it's a series of nodes where you have some data. In this case, it's this, this text string, but it could be anything. And then you have a pointer to the next node. And these have lots of useful properties. Um, for one, you can iterate through a linked list. Uh, another interesting idea is that uh, page one, which is what we started with, represents a linked list that contains page one, page two, and page three. But page two also represents a linked list, but it is a linked list of just page two and page three. But we can play the story starting from page two just as well as we can play it starting from page three. All right, and here you see you get uh, the rest of the story. And, and that's the sense in which this is a recursive data structure, right? Each, 
each node of a linked list is a linked list itself. You've always got the node you're in and then the rest of the nodes. Um, and, and this is the, the concept we're going we're gonna to build on um, to make this text adventure much, much more interesting than just a linear story. Um, there's other things you can do with the linked list. Like I talked before about the ability to um, add new pages and delete pages uh, at runtime. And I think that's what we'll start with uh, next week. And then we'll also make uh, <clears throat> our text adventure have uh, branching possibilities next week rather than just being linear. We'll give the, uh, the player some choices he can make or she can make. And we'll have an, a new data structure that can handle uh, a story with uh, branching possibilities in it, kind of like you see in uh, games like, like Skyrim where you get four choices Maybe two of them actually matter, and you get different storyline based on what you what you pick. So uh, today was a big day. We covered a lot of stuff. Uh, pointers get pretty complicated. Uh, don't feel bad if these are confusing at first, uh, but it's a really cool and important idea. Uh, recursion is also complicated, but again, a cool and important idea. Um, so this would be a, a fun uh Thing to, to play around with, uh, starting with this. If you want some some homework things to, to try playing around with, uh, one thing you can try is um, add a function that will insert a new page after a given page. And you can try to add a function that will delete a page from the list. Uh, so those are some things you can, you can try to do. They might be a little hard, but it, it'll be a fun giving it a try. Uh, any questions about anything anything we've got over today? I'll keep chat up for a while to see if anyone's got questions. Uh, yeah, I am I am keeping a uh, repository of the code in GitHub. Um, if you if you donate ten dollars, you get added to that uh, repository. So you're so you're free to see it. Uh, otherwise, you just got to watch the videos and Type along with it, and then you'll have your own copy of the code. Anything else? Anything at all? Okay, looks like no questions so far. Um, if anyone manages to get some of these things working and wants to, to show off uh, how you did it on the next episode, um, you can do that. We just uh, a good way to do it actually is there's a, a website called Gist. It's part of GitHub, and if you go to uh, just Google Google Gist. And you can uh, copy and paste code in there, and you can paste links uh, into chat. It's just an easy way. It formats your code real nice in whatever whatever language you want. Um, then we can kind of like people could show off their uh, their homework answers basically if you want to. And there's a cool way to do delete that we can uh, talk about next time as well. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and I'll see you again in a couple days. Bye for now.